Welcome, everybody. It's so glad that we're going to be getting those historic walking tours again in May. That's going to be, that's wonderful. And, but we have a number of different programs that we are doing for the Sparta Speak series this year. Some are going to be in person and outdoors, but several of them, like tonight's program, uh, are going to be virtual. And you can find more information about these on the Jug Tavern website. And um, I'm just going to walk through a couple of those uh, with, with you. So tonight, of course, we're gonna hear from Joyce Sherrock Cole. I can hardly wait. So I'm gonna get through this quickly. Um, and then in June, we're going to have a virtual program from Amanda Bailey of Planet Wild. She's a landscape artist that deals with native plants and she wants to bring the wild nature back to your backyard. Um, and that should be a very interesting program on June 2nd. Uh, it's going to be in the evening from Zoom. There is through Zoom, and there is the um, the link there at the bottom if you'd like to join us that evening. So put it on your calendar. Something we're very excited about is this is going to be our first our first event back together in July in a backyard of Sparta. It's going to be the women from the Ramapo Lenape Nation with Chief Clara Soaringhawk and artist Lisa Lavart. We're going to have a rain date of Sunday, July 18th. This is going to be a program of the artist Lisa Lavard and, Ch and Chief Clara talking about a collaborative art project to share and save women's stories as they're handed down through the generations. And they have also um, made a documentary film that went with this and the filmmaker will be there and we will have a viewing of this uh, film that evening and this will be held at sundown. So this is gonna be a very special event. It's gonna be very limited seating. We're gonna start um, accepting RSVPs in, as of June 20th, um, but you know, definitely mark your calendar for this one. All of these are gonna be terrific. Back by popular demand, we're gonna have Sue Altman. She's gonna talk specifically about um, Frederick Edwin Church and his artwork. He's a master of the Hudson River School um, and his contributions to that school and to landscape artists beyond. She's also going to talk about his um, home on the east bank of the Hudson River, Olana. I don't know if you visited it, but she's going to talk about it uh, some that evening. This will be a virtual event. Again, you join through Zoom by clicking on this link right here, and that will be also on a Wednesday night, August 4th at 7.30 p.m. And drum roll, please. We're going to have the Sparta Garden Tour 2021. Um, and we're gonna have a self-guided walking tour through the backyards and front yards and walkways of uh, Sparta residents. And you'll be able to RSVP for that after August 1st. So be sure to uh, bookmark our website and our events so that you can, that you can join us for all of these terrific, terrific things. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. One, ask, one thing you might wanna do uh, before our presenter comes on is uh, in the upper right corner of your screen, you'll see something that says view. There are a couple of different views. If you wanna see everybody listening, you can leave it on gallery view, but you might wanna uh, change over to speaker view right now. And so now I get to introduce our speaker for this evening. It's always my lucky job to do that and I'm thrilled. Um, our guest speaker tonight is Joyce Chirac Cole. And last summer, Joyce was appointed our new village historian and she made history herself because she is the first African-American appointed to this position in Ossining. And she has enthusiastically taken up this role. Joyce is a lifelong resident of Ossining. She graduated from Ossining schools as did her three children after her. She holds a bachelor of science degree in organizational management and she is certified by Boston University as a genealogical researcher. Joyce's specialization in family history underlies her view of local history as a long interconnected story of community. Her roots go back in Ossining to the early 1900s. She's a founding member and lead researcher of the Little Birdie County Genealogical Society, which facilitates the Ossining Public Library Genealogy Group, made up of Ossining residents, whose ancestors migrated to Ossining from Bertie County, North Carolina. She takes great joy in giving back to Ossining and helping others find their family stories. In fact, she has developed the Discovering in Genealogy Program, or DIG, 
to promote self-discovery through genealogical research. And she's really been busy. She has presented talks in Ossining to the schools, the library, the Rotary Club, the Historical Society, and the Ossining Historic uh, Cemeteries Conservancy. This past February, Joyce made several presentations about Ossining's Black History and Celebration of Black History Month. She presented her research um, to the Sing Sing Prison Museum Justice Talk series, and she curated a month-long exhibit at Bethany Arts Community entitled Ossining Black History and Culture, Resilience, Dedication, Excellence. Video recordings of these events are available online through the Sing Sing Prison Museum and Bethany Arts Community Facebook pages and on the Village Historian page of the Village of Ossining website. Joyce actively serves on the Ossining Historic Preservation Commission and on the boards of the Bethany Arts Community and the Ossining Historic Cemeteries Conservancy. We're so very fortunate that the history of Sparta is included in her research interests. Tonight, we will hear the amazing story of one of Sparta's residents of the 19th century, Captain Lewis Brady. I'm going to now turn it over to Joyce Chirac Cole. Thank you, Martha. Um, thank you, everyone. And I'm so grateful to the Jug Tavern for having me here today to present this research. And if I get a little excited and start jumping around in my chair, I'll be back. Uh, I just had a lot of fun uh, doing this. And, and what I found was quite incredible. Um, so I'm going to stop uh, rambling and, and get started. So uh, Captain Lewis Brady's life is fascinating. Um, and many of you already know, if you're part of the Jug Tavern, uh, the, the parts that we know already before I talk about more of his life. But for those that don't, I just want to read the um, excerpt out of the Sparta Cemetery Tour booklet about his life. So Captain Lewis Brady was born into slavery in 1773 and died October 29, 1881, aged 108 years. His father belonged to General Washington and was set free at the death of Mrs. Washington. His mother belonged to Colonel David Zabriskie of DC and she bought her freedom, but her son remained a slave for several years longer. In the War of 1812, he was the body servant of Colonel Zabriskie and was with him in battle. At the death of the Colonel, Lewis Brady escaped into Pennsylvania and then found his way to New Jersey and then to New York. He was industrious and frugal and bought a small sloop with which he entered into the clam and oyster trade. From the time of, his, of the purchase of his sloop, he was known as Captain Lewis Brady. He is the oldest person buried in the cemetery. So that is incredible by itself. Uh, that's enough to make you just like, wow, what about this man? But it leaves a lot of questions. Um, a lot of questions about his enslavement, uh, the person that owned him, what was his journey here, and why our little place of Osning? How did you find it on the map? Um, so first, uh, tracing the lineage of a formerly enslaved person is very difficult, if not impossible. Um, and we hope uh, as a researcher that we are left some breadcrumbs that, that leave us with some hints of their past, maybe a little bit of the story, and if you're really lucky, a whole story. So I'm happy to say that I found a breadcrumb. Maybe I would even call it a crouton. It was a little bigger than a breadcrumb. Um, so here we go. So my breadcrumb was in the form of an interview uh, that was conducted by a New York Herald reporter in 1880 of Lewis Brady when he was 107 years old. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't remember two days ago what I had for dinner. So someone being able to give an account of their life at the age of 107 is pretty impressive. Um, so this is an account of his life in his words from his enslavement to his settlement here in Osning, which is just incredible. So what I was, uh, I want to share with you my screen. Hold on. Give me a thumbs up if you all see it. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the journey to freedom uh, 
and a place to call home. So I told you I had my, my, uh, my breadcrumb, it was this, this interview. And what I was most impressed about uh, with this was the fact that we never get a picture of him. We don't know what he looks like. We don't know what Lewis Brady looks like. There's no painting of him. We, don't, we only see his house usually when we're presenting about him or uh, we, we see his tombstone. So I was so excited when the interviewer took the time to get a to describe his uh, him physically and then talk about his character. So what we learned of him at 107 years old was he was a tall, intelligent looking Negro. And I'm still trying to figure out what that second part is. How do you look like the intelligent looking Negro? But we're gonna work on that. Um, his hair was white as snow. His shoulders were a little rounded. And I don't know if you're doing, when I read this every time, I. I round my shoulders. I know I don't know why I do that. Uh, he walked with a tottering gait because he had rheumatism in one ankle, which made him a little lame. But he said that he um, actually he was working in the garden the day of the interview and told the reporter he can run a small foot race with anyone at 107 years old. Um, he was unable to read and write and that I was able to get from a census. And he was also described as strictly and scrupulously fair and honest. So we have someone that we only saw a tombstone, but now we can close our eyes and try to get a picture of, of this man that we, we so wanna learn about. But the other thing that was interesting to me was that his story, I found his story all over the country how did this man without Twitter and Facebook and, and the news make, our little Osnan made the paper with this runaway slave. So, I, you know, he has to be pretty incredible to make the news all over the country about his life. And it was both with his interview versions of his interview and or his uh, death notice uh, that they kept tabs on his life. So this interview was the served as the basis of my my research. So without further ado, I'll present to you my findings in the life journey of Lewis Brady. But maybe not. In 1773 in Kent County, Maryland, the man that we know as Lewis Brady was actually born by the name Noah. His name was not Lewis Brady. And he um, was born to in, into slavery, to enslaved parents. Um, and what we know about his parents from his words is his father was a slave of President George Washington and his mother a slave of Colonel David Zabriskie who had a plantation near Washington but mostly lying in the um, District of Columbia. It was not uncommon of the time on neighboring plantations to have children with um, and a slave marriage because slaves were not allowed to marry. Um, they were property. So the slave marriage meant that their, plant, their masters allowed them to have a relationship, um, but it was not a binding one, but an understanding that they had a family. Um, in fact, slave owners thought that the arrangement of having the, the uh, slave having a family on another plantation close by to be beneficial uh, because the rationale was that the man is not going to run away and leave his family. Behind. Thus them losing their property and their labor. So I just want to show you um, this in action. This actually came from my family papers. Uh, Samuel Chirac, who was the uh, owner of my family, and he's selling uh, my family and the property, but he is mentioning, if you look towards the uh, bottom, that he has five valuable Negro men and they have families in the neighborhood, so he wants to keep them um, together. So, that, you know, it was very well known about this keeping the families together, keeping the men close to home because they're not going to run away and leave their family. So what is also intriguing to me was that his last name was Brady. 
And uh, just so you all know, I am still researching. I have worked um, to do this with DC. Um, every place I talk to you about, I've talked to their lands and records. I've been in touch with the historians at Mount Vernon Plantation. Uh, we've been sharing information. Um, so I'm still waiting on more. But the fact that he took the last name Brady um, is interesting to me because it's was he owned by a Brady in which I did find Brady uh, slave owners next to Mount Vernon, but he did not keep the name Zabriskie. Um, but there were Brady slave owners in Kent County, but it's not unusual for a slave to take a different name. So Noah recounted spending time at Washington's plantation often, and he mentioned the names of slaves in this interview um, that he remembered. So I said, I have to fact check this. Did he really remember the names of the slaves? So he said, Bill Cook, Daddy Pumpy, and Abe Rodwell were slaves on the Washington plantation. And in searching the database of slaves at Mount Vernon, he was absolutely correct. Bill Cook, there was a Bill, there were five slaves by the name of Bill or Billy. There was a Pompey, there was only one slave named Pompey and he was listed as 25 years old in 1771. He was at the Brick House Plantation and owned by George Washington and John Park Custis. And Abe Rodwell that he mentioned, there were five slaves named Abraham. So this 107 year old was doing, doing pretty good with his memory so far. And it was likely that he spent so much time at, um, at Mount Vernon because he was probably hired out to work uh, the plantation and the payment would go to his owner or he was there if his mother was working. In 1799, I want us to really, when I, when I bring up the ages, uh, the, the years, pay attention to the age of what he's doing um, as we go along. So at 26 years old in 1799 is when George Washington died. He was not at the plantation that day, but he recall, recalled the procession. And George Washington's will, it was his desire to manumit his slaves upon the death of his wife, Martha Washington. However, she was not comfortable waiting for the slaves to uh, wait on her death to be free. So she freed them earlier in 1801. Noah's father was freed from slavery, which proves to us that he was solely owned by George Washington and not a dower slave of Martha because she did come into the marriage with her own slaves. Um, shortly thereafter, Noah's mother purchased her freedom from Colonel Zabritsky. However, she was not able to buy Noah's, so he remained in slavery with Colonel Zabritsky. And at this time, I cannot find evidence of Colonel Zabritsky's property, but I am awaiting records from DC on such. In 1812 to 1814, Noah is 39 years old. And he was um, the body servant of Colonel Zabriskie, who was in the first, now Colonel Zabriskie was in the first Maryland regiment and participated in the Battle of Bladesburg. Body servants took care of the needs of their master during war foraging for food, tending to the horse, filling the canteens. They usually stayed behind the wagon. They uh, dig trenches, sometimes side by side in battle with their master. However, they were prohibited from carrying a weapon. So I don't know how that worked <laughs> in battle, not having a weapon. But most body servants, when they were not in war, uh, were in position of trust and privilege and probably house servants that were very close to their master. At the death of Zabriskie, he left in his will his slaves to be divided uh, by his niece and nephew, Jacob and Betsy Keys. And that was according to um, Brady in his interview. And he was right, I did find Jacob and Betsy Keys in the census. Betsy married a miller from Dover County, from Dover, Delaware, named Thomas Reese. He owned a large grist mill that Noah worked. Reese 
after an argument, renamed Noah Lewis after what they called a disagreement, and he remained Lewis Brady for the remainder of his life. In 1820, Thomas Reese, as Noah put it, became started to become, um, well, now he was Lewis, brandied up. He became quite uh, partial to drinking and his started to lose some of his, um, his money and he needed to liquidate his assets and he started with his slaves. Lewis was sent um, on, on a regular basis from the grist mill to deliver flour um, to the local tavern. So on one particular day, he was taking uh, flour to the slave depot and tavern. They were connected, owned by a, a man named Jacob Bidwell. And I did find Jacob as well. The mill um, superintendent's name was Brummel. And I did find a Brummel in the census in Dover. He informed Lewis that he was going to be sold and told him to head to the sales room. Uh, now there's a, a, a bit of a conflicting story, but it goes that he went into the sales room. He was very shocked that he was gonna be sold, especially at his age. And he gets up on the showroom floor to be examined by the potential buyers. This is an actual um, dealer in sales place and slaves. Um, and he gets on the showroom floor and he passes out as they look for him uh, they look at him to evaluate him. So they get him up and they send him home and tell him he's going to come back the next day to be sold. So he gets back um, to the plantation that he was um, enslaved at and collected his belongings. And in Lewis's own words, he said, that night I lit out and I never went back again either. Lewis Brady. So he was said to have really tied his clothes onto a stick, just as we see there. And he, um, he left out and never went back. Um, he traveled four miles to the house of a white man named Jacob Sanders, um, who I did find also, who worked for his master. And he told him about his impending sale and asked for the best way to get out of state. And Saunders instructed him to head for New York State. So what I found also um, really interesting is Jacob Sanders had to be a man that talked about uh, not um, being in agreement with the institution of slavery for him to feel very comfortable running away four miles to get advice on how to run away. So the question is, how did he do it? And this is the part where I get up and run around and then I come back, but I'm not really going to get up. I was very excited about this uh, part uh, once I was able to prove that this is what happened. But I've never in my life been able to say that I knew someone that escaped slavery via the Underground Railroad. His first stop was Chester County, PA. He wintered with an old Quaker preacher named Jesse Kersey. And Jesse Kersey, as I said, was a preacher and he was a potter. He was well known um, for those two things and being um, one of the most prolific speakers of his time. He spoke against the evils of slavery openly. In 1814, he visited the South in relation to the cruel and unrighteous system of American slavery and the mode of deliverance from its terrible consequences, having opportunities with the President of the United States and other distinguished men and holding meetings among the people of color and others. He describes slavery as one of the greatest evils that ever the spirit of delusions has succeeded in imposing upon mankind. Just a few years later, he helped Lewis Brady by letting him stay and work his land until he moved to his next stop. So Jesse Kersey was his first conductor on the Underground Railroad. And you see right here, he started um, in Chester. His second stop was in Bucks County, Pennsylvania with a man named Lukens. So when I went to go look at, try to find any Lukens in Bucks County, I found them and they were also Quakers. 
he worked the summer for um, the Lukens uh, family and he saved his money. And the Lukens family were in the Society of Friends and, and found also in documentation with Jesse Kersey. So there was the connection. And as I started to see this, it started to make sense because um, Chester County was where Harriet Tubman, that was like the, uh, the hub of the Underground Railroad. But a little later, um, Lewis Brady was moving a, a little closer to the beginning because it started in 1800. Um, so I'm awaiting some more records from Bucks County on the Quaker meeting minutes uh, to see if I can find more about Lewis in there. So from Bucks County, he moved on to Trenton, New Jersey, then to New Brunswick, and he tried to get on a vessel, but the captain would not take him. So he continued on foot to Elizabethtown and he tried to cross on a ferry to New Blazing, um, on a ferry called the New Blazing Star Ferry to Staten Island. And the ferryman um, did not want to take any more runaway slaves. He said, that's enough, I've taken too many. Um, but if you see right here in Trenton and he goes to New Brunswick, and he, uh, you'll see he goes to Rahway, he took the alternate route. If you see um, where he's going, he's taking the alternate route. Um, but what it told us there is his intention wasn't to get to Osning. His first, his first, um, his end spot was supposed to be Staten Island, but he couldn't get there. Where he was headed was Rossville in Staten Island. Um, and Staten Island had a small community called Sandy Ground that is still there today. Uh, this place is pretty incredible. It's uh, free and self-emancipated Africans. Um, and it's comprised of, comprised of black oystermen who had fled Maryland and Virginia, came to the island to harvest oysters in Prince's Bay on the island's South shore. Sandy Ground also was a major stop along the Underground Railroad for slaves escaping from the South. In 1828, Lewis was now 55 years old. So if we're paying attention, he's not young and he's, he's running, this, running here at you know, a very advanced, he's at an uh, older age that he's running and doing this. And he stayed in Rahway for about two years or so. Um, so 1828, he's 55 and he ends up, he's in Tarrytown. So he went to Tarrytown first. That is where he met and married Sarah Ann Thompson who was considerably younger than he um, I think he had her about almost 40 years, which was not um, uncommon of that time. Sarah was born in Tarrytown um, to her parents that were also in Tarrytown. They had three children, Mary M, John W, and Anne Elizabeth. And this is the beginning of the Brady family tree. It's much bigger now. And in 1836, Lewis at the age of 63 settles here with us in Osning, well then Sing Sing. He purchased his home um, in, in 1836 from James and Harriet Knowlton for $150, which is equivalent today to $4,272.21. This is when he purchased a small boat he called the come and go, and he was selling clams and oysters. And at that time is when he became known as Captain Lewis Brady. In 1853, at the age of 80, I find a quick claim and he's transferring ownership of his property to his son, John W. Brady for the sum of $100. However, Brady and Sarah will remain on the property until the length of their natural life. This at this time, 
was Brady establishing generational wealth for his family. This man was previously enslaved. He did not have control over his own life. He did not have a wife when he left and he managed to come even at that age and he established a business. He had a wife, he had children, he had property and he was teaching his family to keep it in the family to start to build some generational wealth. And even following the family further, uh, John, his son, would go on to buy property on Secor Road. He opened up a barber shop on Secor Road. And in his will, he, they would continue to buy property. And he left his property to his niece and nephews. And it just went on and on. So this family did an incredible job uh, from descending from a man that was a slave. Um, so it is pretty just incredible, um, their life. And even leaving money, I believe one of the sons, one of the grandsons left money to the Ossining Hospital and to starve Bethlehem Baptist Church. So in 1880, at 107 years old, is when he left me my breadcrumb or my crouton to tell me everything that I just discovered. So everything he said, I was able to go back and fact check it. And um, with the exception of Zabriskie that I'm still waiting on, everything he said was spot on. And with that and um, the help of the clerk's office in Osning and getting the um, death certificate um, and seeing that he was a slave and hit, figuring out who his wife was and building the tree, I'm able to rebuild their life um, and his journey here and how he got to us. So he was affectionately known and called Noah, Noah Brady, Louis Brady, Lou Brady, Uncle Lou Brady, Uncle Lou, Captain Brady, Captain Louis Brady. So in 1881, at the age of 108 years old, Lewis Brady passes, and we all know this, Tombstone and, and Sparta Cemetery. Um, now we know more about his life and how he got here to us. This story is pretty incredible. Um, and he said, uh, the death notice said he died of old age, and he was said to have left the house the day before his death, and he fell. He laid outside for several hours before being found. Um, I just want to give credit to Sparta Cemetery for giving him credit for being in the War of 1812, if you see the flag and then the medal, because body servants um, were not credited with service because they were not considered to be in war. They were... Um, fulfilling their duties as slaves to their masters. So I think that it's pretty awesome that they were given, that he was given credit. So in light of everything we just heard, even them saying that he was an awesome person, a man of great character, it said in his, um, in one of the death notices, it is to be hoped that he has gone where all the good darkies go. So the sentiment is still the same, no matter how much this man had accomplished in 108 years, that the part, the last thing that they would say in his death notice in just in White Plains was we hope that he has gone where all the good darkies have gone. Um, so I, I leave you with that in this incredible life and legacy that this man has left. And I would, um, I, I'm really pleased to announce that in building his tree, I was able to find living family, living descendants of Lewis Brady living in White Plains. And they had no idea about their uh, legacy of him. And I was able to deliver their history back to the family. So thank you so much um, for listening. I hope that you learned something new about Lewis Brady. I was really excited. Um, I've never, I've always heard about the Underground Railroad, but it's different when you've actually followed someone's path. 
using the Underground Railroad to come to our very own village. So thank you for listening. Let me unshare my screen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joyce. That was amazing. That was amazing how you found all that information. I had one question. Um, I know that you're waiting for information to come back from other locations about Colonel Zabriskie and from Washington. Um, I know that you've done a lot of this research like in the last year, right? Yes. When yes. we're all shut down. So am I, am I correct to assume that you did it mostly online I and did. were able to really sleuth that out? Or is it a combination of that and finding places to ask and writing well, well-versed letters to get the information you were looking for? So it was a little bit of both. Um, so before we started to open back up, I got a lot of this great stuff more recently. So some of the places are opening back up. They're not letting people in, um, but just a newspaper will really just help you out. And it's taking each and every fact and just fact checking every little thing. Just the fact that he was spot on. I just can't believe it. That's um, amazing. That being able to go on Ancestry, Family Search, the newspapers, um, calling down to the places, calling Bucks County and talking to the historians, talking to the historians at Mount Vernon. Um, it was just, you just get some clarity and we're all, and you know, you know how it is, we're all talking and we're like, oh, you just solved that mystery for me. So we were helping each other. We were like little nerds on the phone for hours, uh, just going back and forth. Um, That's the best. <laughs> Yeah, picking up the phone does does help, um, but you can you can achieve a lot online and not have to leave. There was a question in the chat. Um, someone asked um, how old um, Lewis's wife was when they married, and when did she start having children? Do you could you answer that question? She started uh -huh. having children in her late teens. Yeah, he was old. She was only about uh, fifteen or sixteen. Um, and he was, he was much older. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and it sounds horrible now, but of that time that happened quite often. So that she probably knew her great, her grandchildren and her great grandchildren here in Austin. Yeah, she was, she lived longer. Um, not a whole lot longer, but she did live longer. Mm -hmm. I followed the whole family. So if anybody wanted to, to know more later, I followed everybody. <laughs> Everybody. We have a question. Uh, where was his house in Ossining is it, and is it still standing? Well, yes, it is. <laughs> we just, um, you want to show the, I can show the picture. I'm going to share again. Here we go. We pass it every day. If you're going to Arcadian and need to shop, here is his house. Um, what number is it, Martha? I forget. Um, I think I, I, uh, Alan, do you know? I, I, I think can't it's remember. 14. Is it 14? I, I think somebody said 14. We can is ask right. <clears throat> we can ask Michael, who just posted in chat uh, that he's the one who's living in the house now. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yes, hi. Yes, it's 14. Okay. That's wonderful. <laughs> so no one go into Michael's house, even though we really want to, because <laughs> what, what Brady was doing. Um, but there was also something interesting I did not put on there. There's, a, I actually have a lot more information than I um, put in the presentation because we'd have been here all night. But there was a period where he had some of the Bird family living with him coming from England. So I, I just found it really interesting that this man, that, that you know, the, the community was comfortable enough to not get angry with a white family with this formerly enslaved black man um, and them staying in the house. So I thought that that was pretty incredible and interesting um, information. And and the house is not, is it that big? Is it big enough, Michael? Michael, I'm all on you now. You should... I, I don't know where they would have gone. <laughs> it's, uh, it's about 1,100 square feet. Okay, all right. There's and another this... question. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say, this is one of the upstairs uh, bedrooms. Oh, okay. We can There's do another an impromptu, an impromptu yeah. house tour from Michael, but that's probably asking too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
We'll be there in 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see, buddy. Okay. You can get there faster than that. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, a question in the chat box that it's a, a good question from Tamara. And it is, was it usual for enslaved people escaping via the Underground Railroad to stop and work for several months in various locations? I always thought that they kept moving north as fast as possible. So that was my impression as well um, before I um, before I did this research, and he was stopping to make his money. Uh, the first thing they said was he was frugal, and he he had a mission. He was and he was an older man, um, so he he knew in his mind that he needed to go. I need to have some means. Um, so they they did stop, and they couldn't go nonstop. So they had to they had these. Uh, stops on the Underground Railroad that if it was Martha, are you frozen? I'm I'm not frozen. Okay. <laughs> I think you just unfroze, maybe. Okay. Or um Dan, yes, I am Sonny Chirac's cousin. <laughs> uh, where, how did those slaves know where to head? Um, that was the conductors were helping them. So when he first st started with the first gentleman, he told him to head to New York State, and that's how I was able to follow. He went, followed the train. It was so incredible. You re I really, literally, I'm not playing, ran around in a circle when I figured this out and I could not believe it. Uh, but uh, each time he got to a conductor, they told him where to go next. Martha, you see anything else? I don't see anything else. I have one last question. Maybe you could talk about some of the resources that are available at the Austin Public Library if people want to embark on their own search? Oh yeah, uh, so they have the free subscriptions to um, Ancestry.com. You're not able to save your um, tree at the library, but you can start some um, work. If you lived in Austin, if your family descends from Austin, you have uh, directories. Um, if you need to sit at the, um, the computer, you can get on Family Search, but that you can also do from home for free. You can also look at the newspapers, FultonHistory.com is a fantastic resource. If your family was in New York, uh, newspapers.com. Uh, you can ask me <laughs> and Martha, who like to dib dabble in, in uh, genealogy. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's where you can start. Um, Joyce, did you see that someone posted that they are descended from Adam Bird? That's one of the comments. Ooh. Yeah, oh. so Valerie Holmes, if she wants Valerie. to. Yes, please reach out to me. I was really, I want to follow the, the line that stayed with him. Um, they had, it said they were from England um, and it was just interesting. I need to fill in the blanks of um, why they were there for that period of time. I was wondering if they just got there and were trying to establish a home. And I know that the birds did have a home. So I'd love to look into that more. You just the birds were like, I think they were like next door neighbors too. Yes. It's a rat. Louis Brady. Yeah. Can't come out. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I want to look into that further. Anyone else? I'm wondering how, so how did you find um, the the descendants in White Plains? I mean, was that all through Ancestry.com or? Ancestry, Facebook, um, did I use LinkedIn? No, I think I was able to achieve it with Ancestry, Family Search, and um, Facebook. So I followed the lines for each child as far as I can find them on Ancestry. Then I started to find um, death notices for people that were dying and I go into their obit, so I'll Google as well. And then I start looking for their kids and then I start working towards people that would be living. Then I go to Facebook and then I start looking for people with the name. And then usually because we post a lot about our lives that you know, grandma 
Pam died and now her obits up and now I connected you because you put Pam, Grandma Pam in the picture and you've listed the kids that I already know were in the tree and I was able to find the family. I guess you could get a job with the CIA now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's amazing. And the did, hunt is did the you thing. tell them did you tell them where his grave is and everything? I mean I I everything. Um I found actually found one of his descendants was on um ancestry and mm. she did not know. So I had to, you know, prove to her and let her know I wasn't crazy and coming to kill her. Um <laughs> that, that you know, this is your I said, you have an incredible history, just incredible. And I just I said, I'm not trying to sell you anything. So here it is. So it's yours. So she was just floored. She did not. She said, how did you find me? So I told her how I super sleuthed her. And she was just like, I can't believe that. So, but she, they were, she was very happy and she cried a little because she said, you know, that's why she was on Ancestry was trying to put those pieces together. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Anyone else? Oh, someone asked where he sold his clams. That's a good question. Um, well, I heard that they said he was right on the Hudson. So I think it went down to the city. I, I think I read that in one of the articles that he, around locally and then they were sending it down to the city. Yeah, so would they have, would he have, I mean, would he have done clamming at Sparta? Was that something that happened on the river right there? Do we know? I need to look into that further because I was questioning that. I know that it in sandy um, ground that that's what you know that's how they were able to cultivate because the it was there in um, right. that island. But I have to look into that further about his come and go, his sleuth and his boat, his oyster business. Yeah, I never, I never. I mean, it makes sense that there was an oyster business up here, and the river used to be full of oysters. But I just never really thought about that as one of. Like you think about the mines up here and then the quarries, but I'd never really thought about something like oysters before. Yeah. We should reach out to Scott Craven. He mm -hmm. might know how long the oyster and the clam business, uh, you know, survived up this way. Yeah, Very cool. Thank you, Margaret. I'm gonna um, talk with Scott about that. When was a uh, Sparta duck in business. Do we have the years for that? About from about 1795 to about 1820. It was right around around um, Alan, tell me if I've got any of this mixed up, but it was around 1807 that the um, um, that Route 9 was was moved over. <laughs> and at that point People could get to the docks in Ossining or in Sing Sing quicker, and they also had cheaper fees. So there were a couple of different issues that were going on that um, made Sparta less attractive as a dock. And then there was, the, of course, the coming of the railroad, which just bypassed Sparta, and it was harder to get across to the river. You have anything to add to that, Alan? No, you, you got it all down. I think the, the railroad wasn't until about the 1830s. So the dock may have held on till then. Any other questions? Yeah, and someone just pointed out that um, that uh, he was told that S Scott Craven talked about the huge oyster trade in the area and that there were a lot of oyster shells out on Croton Point, which yeah, you can definitely still see those, those in bricks. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Joyce, thank you so much. This was really incredible. And uh, I took tons of notes <laughs> um, and it was a uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation and you've really filled in a piece of Sparta history that we all kind of had little bits and pieces of, but now we have a full, full narrative, which is very exciting. So thank you. Thank you for having me.